Well, good morning, church. Today happens to be the graduation Sunday. So quick shout out to all the graduates. We're so proud of you guys. Yes, give it up. And to all the guests and visitors, welcome. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 13. We're going to camp out there for our entire time. And as you guys are turning there, I'm going to talk. There's an auntie in our community. She's a family friend of ours. And every morning for the past two years, she has texted me a Bible verse. And I'm talking really early, like 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock early. And over the past few years, I've grown to appreciate to this small gesture so much as I walk through the different seasons of my life. And when Jitta Chach asked me to share from the word a few weeks back, my first thought in my head was, nope. And my second was, why should I? Why should I when there are pastors and elders and other men and women who are more experienced and knowledgeable than I? And so I asked him for a couple of days to think about it and get back to him, which he graciously allowed. And those next two days, that auntie texted me two Bible verses. The first one was from Hebrews chapter 3, where it talks about exhorting one another every day while it is still called today. And the second one was from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul opens up and he says, I'm not coming to you with human wisdom or eloquence, for I decided to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And just later on, he said to encourage me, make much of Jesus, make, make much of him. And so today, that's my plan. This day, where we gather in the house of the Lord, we get this opportunity to exhort one another in worship and in word, looking to the face of Jesus. And it has nothing to do with my wisdom or my eloquence, but it has everything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the one thing that has changed my life and continues to do so on a daily basis. And I hope that that's your, that's your testimony as well. And specifically, I want to see how the gospel is revealed in John chapter 13. So come with me there. We're going to read the first five verses together, and I'll read it. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So the book of John, it has 21 chapters. From chapter 12 all the way to about half of chapter 20, it talks about the days before Jesus goes to the cross. So some scholars think about a week. So nearly half of the book of John is dedicated to that time right before Jesus is crucified. And several times it says that the time has not yet come. And then with John chapter 12 and 13, it finally says the hour has come. And we know that the hour is for Jesus to be crucified. So even if the world didn't know what was about to go down, and even if his disciples didn't understand how, how heavy that was, Jesus knew. He knew that the sin of the world was about to be placed upon him, and he was going to be crushed in our place. And knowing all of this, we see what he does in verse 4 and 5. He gets up, he takes off his robe, he wraps a towel around his waist, he gets water in a basin, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. So this morning, what I want to attempt to answer is, why did Jesus wash the feet of his disciples? And there are several reasons, but I just want to touch on three. The first one is because he loved them. Very simple. They're all very simple. The people that were in the room at this time were his 12 disciples, the, one that, the ones that he handpicked and chose. And a lot of them were poor and uneducated fishermen. And let me remind you that it was shortly before this that they had actually had a discussion or argument that who would be the greatest amongst themselves. As they were weak, they were dull, they were prideful, but Jesus still loved them and he took care of them. Now, the washing of the feet back in those times was a common practice. The fact that they didn't have such nice shoes that we have today, they didn't have socks, they only had sandals. And then you pair that with the dirty roads they walked in, 
that means that as soon as you walk on the streets, their feet would get very dirty very quickly. So as you walk into somebody's house, you would have your feet washed. But the washing of the feet was done by, not by the highest of the household, but the lowest. So if you had servants, it would be the servants washing their feet. And not just any servant, but the lowest servant would be the one that would be reserved to wash somebody's feet, especially for guests. There were two instances where Jesus had his feet washed. Let's take a look at that. The first one was with Mary, the sister of Martha. And this is in John chapter 12, where she comes and anoints the feet of Jesus with expensive ointment and wipes his feet with her hair. And this is where Judas, in his, he says, why wasn't this sold and the money be given to the beggars? And the second one was when Simon the Pharisee, he invites Jesus to come eat with him and the disciples. And it says that a woman of the city who was known as a sinner, that's the way the, the, the Bible describes her. He, she heard that Jesus was sitting there. And she brings an alabaster jar, and she comes and weeps at the feet of Jesus and washes his feet with the ointment and with her tears. And so we see in contrast, Simon the Pharisee who, who invited Jesus, he sits there in self-righteous contempt, judging both Jesus and the woman, and the woman, forgetting everything else in love, washing the feet of Jesus. And so both instances with Mary and this woman of the city who was a sinner, they both wash the feet of Jesus in different purposes, but they both do it in love and in humility. And in a similar way, so does Jesus. With one of his final acts before he dies, he loves his disciples in this way with love and humility. And it reminded me that even if I am dull and weak and feeble and fickle, the Lord loves me. And even if he hasn't physically washed my feet, even if he hasn't physically washed your feet, he's actually done something far greater. And that's that... He washed us and cleansed us with his blood. And that he did with the ultimate act of love and humility on that cross more than 2,000 years ago. The second reason why he washed their feet is because it represented a spiritual washing. The disciples are shocked or shook at the fact that Jesus is washing their feet. And we see that in verse 8 with Peter's bold statement. When he said, you shall never wash my feet. And he's saying, the hands that have healed so many, that made the blind see, the mute speak, the lame walk, that even raised the dead to life. And even more than that, the one whom we know to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world, those hands would wash my feet. And he says, never. And that word never literally means to eternity, never. But Jesus responds in verse 8. He says, unless I wash you, Peter, you won't belong to me. And Peter, being classic Peter, then says, well, Lord, it's not my feet only, but my hands and my head as well. And to that, Jesus responds, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. And what that means is, this is a brief discussion on justification and sanctification. Justification is a one-time process where God takes somebody who is totally unworthy so far away and declares that person righteous to stand before him. And he does that by the work of Jesus. And so when he says you are already clean, you are already bathed, that is justification. But being justified by God, we know, it doesn't mean that we don't sin. We walk in this world, and as we walk in this world, our feet will get dirty, meaning we will sin. But when we sin, this washing of the sin needs, this washing of the feet needs to happen. And that's sanctification, the daily turning from sin and turning to Jesus, turning away from sin and turning to Jesus. And that's a continual process that we call sanctification, which is the washing of the feet. There's a quote that has meant so much life to me, and I want to share it with you. It's Jesus is always more willing to meet us at the throne of grace than we are willing to meet him there. Jesus is always more willing to meet us at the throne of grace than we are willing to go there. Which means when we sin, Jesus is already there. He wants to cleanse us. He wants us to have a right relationship with us. We don't have to beg for it. But as, as Peter, we must continually submit to that cleansing by Jesus. So when we sin, we go to Jesus because he is so willing to meet us there. And the last reason why Jesus washes their feet is as an example. 
we live in a day and age where even the secular world calls our generations more and more selfish, more self-centered. And even psychologists call it the me first culture, the me first mentality, where it's all about my own comfort, my own success. It doesn't matter who I step on to get to where I want to be. And that's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus, the way that he describes himself is as gentle and lowly. If you go to verse 14, he says, you call me Lord and teacher, and so I am. So he's saying that I am your leader, meaning he can exercise authority over them. Yet he still stoops down and washes their feet. And he doesn't just tell them to do it. He first does it. Then he says, do as I have done to you. Now, he's not literally saying go around and wash everybody's feet. If, you're, if your heart is there, then yes, do it. But it's more than that. He's saying have the mind of Christ. Don't be puffed up because of knowledge or because of position or title, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. You come to verse 17. It says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So it's not just knowing these things in theory in the mind. It's actually practicing it, actually doing it. So blessed are you if you do them. And then verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to one one another. The next verse is, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so how we are set apart from this world is how we have love for one another. And I think this is specifically talking about the body, about the church. How does Hebron love each other, serve each other, forgive each other? So that, so much so that if an outside person were to come in and see how he talks and how she responds, is there grace, is there forgiveness? And take that to a broader sense, how we interact with people in our, in our schools, in our workplaces. Or is it the same thing like the world where the biggest concern is ourselves? And the reason why I bring this up is because I'm not pointing fingers, but it's because I myself am convicted of this. In fact, the past several weeks, the Lord has put a hymn to my mind. Uh, we have come into this place. The specific verse is, so forget about yourself and worship him. Concentrate on him and worship him. This kind of love that Christ commands us to have, this servant-hearted love, is not something that we can procure. It's something that Christ does in us. It's when we understand the love that Christ has for us that we can love in this way. I'll end with a story, uh, with an analogy that John Piper said years ago and that has stuck with me. Before his 25th wedding anniversary, he goes and gets 25 roses. And I've said this before, um, 25 roses. And he goes home, he knocks on the door, and he surprises his wife with these roses. And his wife says, oh, John, these are great. Why'd you do it? And he says, it's my job. It's my duty. It's our 25th wedding anniversary, and it's my job to do this. And that's the first scenario. Now, the second scenario, he does the same thing. He has those flowers in his hands, and he goes and surprises his wife. But this time, when she asked, why'd you do it? He says, it's because I loved you. It's because there's nothing else on this earth I would rather see than you being delighted because I love you. And then Piper looks at the crowd he's preaching to, and he says, some of you will lose time, money, and effort. Some of you will even lose your life for the sake of pursuing Christ. When you die and when you get to heaven, I hope you never say when God asks you, why did you do all this, that you say, well, it's, it's my duty. It's my job. Instead, it should be, Lord, it's because I loved you. Because the gospel gripped my soul and I fell in and out of it. But that gospel brought me right back in. And because you were my first love and everything else was trash as compared to following after you. I think we can do a lot of good things, a lot of good works in this world, in this life. But if our motivation isn't love, then we are, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, meaning it's, it's complete emptiness. It looks great on the outside, but it's empty. In fact, if you look at other religions, they have all these volunteer services. They have... They have feed the homeless, clothe the homeless. Their motivation is so that they can say, they can prove that I've done these things, so I deserve good things. I deserve heaven. 
But that's not our motivation. Our good thing has already been done at the cross. Our motivation is that we love because he first loved us. Because we understand the love of Christ. So to wrap up, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples because he loved them. And in his love, he washes us and cleanses us with his blood. But like Peter, we also must submit to the constant sanctification by Jesus. And remember that he is so willing to do that. He's so willing to meet us there. And lastly, Jesus commands us as the body to love one another as he loved us. And our motivation for what we do and how we love one another is the gospel through and through. May his name be glorified.